but I'd, I'd hope to maybe provide a little insight as to how we and I think a lot of others are thinking about uh, the digital evolution in the logistics industry and, and, and you know, words like digital disruption and, um, and distribution are, are, are obviously common buzzwords. I would like to offer a fourth one that I think is really important and I think that um, as Jim mentioned, um, there, there are a few companies that get it. And, and so in order to talk about the future, I'm going to hit you with a slide that goes a little bit into the past. And obviously, we're in our, our fourth revolution. And the first one, you know, uh, millions of years ago was the hunter-gatherer economy, right? So there was 1.2 million years ago, there were 18,000 people on the face of the earth. Doesn't seem like a lot. And so you go through that whole period and that long period of time. And, and you know, in, in 4,000 BC, you've got the invention of the wheel. And in 8,000 BC, uh, you've got the agricultural economy. Fast forward all the way to uh, the 1700s, like still not a lot of people, 1700s, beginning of the digital, or pardon me, the, uh, the uh, industrial revolution. Nin or 1750, there were only 600 million people on the face of the earth. Think about that just relative to, to where we are today. Today, 2017, there are 7.5 billion people on the face of the earth. And we started the digital uh, evolution in 1970. In 1970, there was four and a half billion. Uh, the projections by the United Nations over the next uh, 20 years, in 2030, they, they think it's going to be eight and a half. And by the time we hit 2050, uh, the population of the world will be 10 billion. So I think demographics are at the very core of what is happening in terms of distribution, disruption, and digital digitalization. And if you think back, just over the last 30 years, and I know it's a bit of an eye chart um, for those of you sitting in the back, uh, but, but, but let's you know, remember when the internet was founded. Let's remember when it wasn't until 2007 that the iPhone was introduced, and a lot of you are probably pulling out and tweeting on that iPhone right now. And you think about the, the ability for us to process data and how it's been fundamentally transformed over the last 30 years, and again, Think about the long history of time of billions of years, millions of years, and where it's going to be over the next five. Those of you that uh, were around in 1961, I was not. Uh, that's the IBM 7030, uh, the, the large system. And uh, that's an operating system. The, the computing power of what you see on the left hand of this screen is contained now in that uh, smartphone on the right hand side. So everything has gotten quicker. The ability to process data has gotten so much faster, uh, and uh, it's gotten smaller, and it's more mobile, and it's, it's transferable. So what does that all mean by, by the year 2020? And some of these are some really interesting statistics and how it's fundamentally going to change. Two-thirds of the global economy will be impacted by the Internet of Things. You think about energy. You think about manufacturing, automotive. Uh, agricultural, and obviously uh, our interest here in this room is transportation and logistics. That's two-thirds of the global economy and the impact of the Internet of Things and what that's going to mean. Uh, 100 million, does anybody know, just out of curiosity, the first commercial application of what's called augmented reality? Obviously everybody knows virtual reality, you're walking around with those, with those uh, 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 headphones or the, 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 the face uh, masks on. But augmented reality is, is overlaying the digital with the real world. And the first commercial application of that was, everybody watches football, was the first, yard, or the first down marker. That was the very first application, commercial application of augmented reality. But today and in the future, we're going to be shopping in an augmented reality environment. And the number of transactions that are going to take place on a daily basis over the internet, $450 billion per day. By the year 2020, and this is a fascinating statistic, and obviously there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, things that you can unpack, but, but we will be having more conversations with bots than we will with our spouses. Some of our spouses actually may like that. Uh, but, but today, when you get out of a car, I just had this example the other day, get out of a car and you uh, give a negative rating to a Uber or a Lyft driver, in your text, immediately thereafter, will be a response that says, hi, Andy, this is Trevor. Um, sorry for your bad experience. There's no way a human looked at that, any of that information. It was an automatic response. It's a bot. Ernst & Young uh, was a, a presentation the other day. They onboard um, 35,000 people a year in their organization. So they bring in 35,000 people in the organization. And that's continued to grow. During that same period of time, they've eliminated 65% of their human resources uh, onboarding team. 
Why? Is because they've brought in over 100 bots that are transacting, that are sending information 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no vacation to those new employees. And those employees are responding to the request of the bots, and the bots are learning. And they're providing better information to, to those employees when they're onboarding. So you, know, you, you think about all these uh, uh, changes that are taking place, and you think about the impact and the market size and the growth of what is you know, the B2C e-commerce. And, and obviously, uh, Jim is uh, a lot more intelligent than, than I am in this particular space. But, but if you think about the B2C commerce uh, uh, in the United States, $370 billion is still just 8%. So it consumes 95% of our mind share in terms of uh, the news, in terms of how things pe people talk about it, but it's just 8% of retail sales today. Obviously, it's growing faster than the brick and mortar. And in the next couple of years, it'll be 15 to 20%, 2030, 2040. The reason it's happening is because of the demographics. And if you think about the B2B e-commerce, it's an even bigger marketplace, and it's growing faster as well. But that's just in the United States, if you think about it. The United States and the economy, uh, you think about Mexico, you think about Brazil, you think about Spain, India, and finally China. There is not an economy in the world today that is not being impacted by e-commerce. And the definition, and it's being expanded and broadened on a daily basis as to what is falling under e-commerce. Uh, Jim mentioned, you know, the number of uh, uh, furniture companies that for years said people will not buy furniture online. Any company that's out there that's selling to the consumer, I can assure you, in the next decade, they will find a way to sell it online. But the really good news is, in globalization, delivery knows no boundaries. If you think about, again, the demographics of where people are located, where people live versus where things are manufactured, uh, it still will continue to exist. There will be a discrepancy between where you manufacture goods. Obviously, you manufacture goods where it costs you the least amount to manufacture and transport them to where people are. And understanding the complexities that are in that is actually a key uh, essential in making sure that as you deliver products to your customers, you have all the tools and resources that you need. What does it come down to? We think, and I think a lot of people out there believe as well, that it comes down to the first thing you have to start with is visibility. In order to make these changes, in order to think about how to get products to customers, you have to know where those products are at all times. And it's not just a last status, it's not, hey, left the terminal. You need to know where it is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And only after you know where things are can you begin to connect all the dots. And then you can begin to layer in systems that collect information from multiple disparate systems. Uh, you know, we all talk about EDI, and we all talk about, you know, the, the prevalence of it, and, and now coming into AP. API and coming into real-time visibility is once you are able to uh, uh, see where things are, then you're able to connect them. And you think about here, here's a map of the world, and it's an example uh, that, uh, that, uh, of a company out there, and you can see all the dots of where their products are at, at any given time of the day, and those little yellow things there uh, coming across, those are ships. You've got planes ready to take off. This is a real live photo of a global supply chain that exists today. So once you are able to have visibility and then you can connect, what can you do? You can start to make choices around where and how and when you're going to move freight. You're going to be thinking about it in a different way, but you can only do that when you know where things are. So now you've, you've gotten visibility and you've gotten connected. What does that lead you to next? Uh, we believe, and I think others are out there, that it's in the machine-to-machine -machine space. You talk about, you know, as, I, as I mentioned, the bots that are out there right now. The machines, simply because they can process information faster uh, and better than humans can, are going to be able to connect the dots quicker than we will. And they will be able to tell you that, hey, if you're low in stock in this particular area, you don't need to pick up the phone. They're already going to be pre-ordering and pre-distributing products into markets where they need to be on a real-time basis. What's fascinating is you got visibility, you got connectivity, you begin to bring machines into and allow them to make better decisions, what's going to happen when we have autonomous vehicles? Because right now, as we all know, uh, one of the, the, the biggest constraints in our environment as, as we move freight across the world is the preference of that driver. And, and by the way, not just the preference of the driver, the actual uh, uh, utilization of the asset which, which they are, are, are driving. Everybody here owns a car, right? 
Does anybody have any idea what their utilization of their, of their current automobile is? Well, so I, I did the calculation this morning as I was preparing for this, and, and my car has 350 hours on it, 14 days. I've owned that car for two years, 2%. Owning an asset, now think about in the transportation world in the United States, obviously it's regulated by, you got 24 hours in the day, it's regulated by, you can drive 11 hours, assuming you're not a team, uh, legally. And of that 11 hours, so, so, so again, you're owning an asset that's only productive 11 out of 24 hours. You think about that productivity of the 11 hours, let's be generous and say it's eight hours because you've got deadhead you know, to and fro, so then of eight hours. And then inside of that, how much freight is actually on that truck? It's a highly inefficient marketplace right now, but not when, and I believe the technology is well in advance of the adoption, I believe it's well in advance of, uh, of, of, of the legal and the legislative, but when you get to that autonomous vehicle, you will now have an asset that has to do a couple of things. One, get loaded. Two, get fuel. And three, get unloaded. And obviously repairs and maintenance go along the way, but the, the initial absor uh, adoption cost will be very high, but the further you go out on that, on that uh, uh, line, the lower the per unit cost will be. You got visibility, you got connectivity, you got the machines, you got autonomous, and then you think about how do we pay each other, right? And the distributed ledger of blockchain, I think they're actually trying to figure out a better way of, of talking about blockchain uh, because it's always associated with, with Bitcoin, which is obviously a commodity, but, but the blockchain and the distributed technology of how we're actually going to pay one another and how we're going to transact. Will we be uh, uh, sending each other uh, wires? Will we be sending each other checks? A lot of us you know, that, that, that employ drivers still actually send out checks. We still send out checks to our drivers. We still get paid by customers uh, via check. You think about when, when you're able to string all of these beads together, what that does with blockchain. And by the way, as we all know, you know it, it resets every, every 10 minutes. Right? There's a new block that's created every 10 minutes. Uh, so it's, it's, it's obviously impenetrable. What does that all mean for the worker? What does that all mean for the, the 7.5 billion people, soon to, be, soon to be 10 billion people that are going to be out there right now? So, so we believe that you know, when you're hiring people, they're going to be doing things on a much more intelligent basis. The days, I dare say, of check calls should be over. There's enough information that's out there right now that we should be connected. And so the people that are doing process work, Probably not the type of worker that, that, uh, that is going to be successful in, in the years to come. But the really good news is in our business and in our world, there are always disruptions. And it takes really smart people with access to really good technology to allow us to make better decisions. We do fundamentally believe that the worker will still be very much involved in this, but they'll be doing a different job. So providers all of us in this room, providers are, are helping our customers get products to where they need at, uh, before they're needed. I, I believe that uh, you know, part of Jim, Jim's message was they're deploying uh, Amazon, Alibaba, they're deploying those resources further in and closer to the customer so that they know what we want before we want it. They know that I need water every two weeks. They know that I'm replenishing my water or uh, paper towels or whatever it is that we're consuming today, they're moving that further and further into the supply chain so that you don't wait. How do you go to one day delivery if you don't have the product? The only way you can do it is if you've moved that all the way in. And again, that goes back to the machines, helping you understand, helping people understand what people are actually doing. I think the importance of, of the supply chain and our logistics functions is only getting more complex. I think the ISM was this past week, um, week before, uh, put out a statistic that 65% of the value of a company's products come from their suppliers. So if you think about that, two-thirds of what a company actually produces comes from uh, another provider or multiple providers, as the case may be. Think about the automotive industry. Think about the manufacturing. and Think about all the complexity that goes in that. They sell a complete good, but they use that. And so the supply chain is only going to continue to get increasingly complex. It's very important that as providers, you understand that and, and know that the value chain that you create is in that one specific area. Who do we think is going to succeed, right? We believe the ones that succeed are going to be the ones that eliminate the friction costs, that eliminate the inefficiencies that are in the supply chain, that are making the right investments today and in the future 
to help their customers achieve their goals. And that their goals, uh, as, as, as the previous speaker spoke about, is to, to satisfy and serve the needs of the customer. It is all about us as a consumer. We want it when we want it. And so how do we as providers help us achieve our goals? And then finally, you gotta do it fast, right? The, the speed is, is, is absolutely critical in this environment. Uh, because if you don't, and, and, and you think about the speed at which Amazon is growing, their compound annual growth rate, since they've been public, and I actually did the numbers, is 45%. And his letter to shareholders in 1997, does anybody know what his, what his annual revenue was in 1997 when they went public? $147 million. Today, at the end of uh, 16, I, I didn't update it for the first quarter, but the end of 16 was $133 billion. $147 million, $133 billion. Speed matters. And so, just so finally, I, you know, actions we can take. Yeah, I think it comes down to a couple of things, which is you've got to consistently invest, and you have to consistently, not constantly, but consistently innovate your business. If you think about, again, I just go back to the demographics, and I, that's how I'd like to wrap it up, is, is if logistics cost as a percent of GDP, or logistics cost as a percent or as a ratio to the number of people in the world today, it will not go up. It will continue to decline. Logistics cost as a percent or as a ratio will continue to decline. So you need to consistently reinvent. You need to consistently innovate. And you need to consistently uh, invest. And you invest in your people and you invest in your processes, and you invest in technology. But timing does matter. Uh, the the on-ramp to, to, to a lot of technology companies that dumped in a lot of money but were really early in the process, well, you know, that on-ramp is littered with dead bodies. And conversely, as we're seeing right now in the retail space, uh, the, 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 the off-ramp, as it were, to people that have not invested, the, the, the off-ramp to the people that have not uh, uh, listened to and, and satisfied the demands and the needs of the customer, well, that's littered with dead bodies as well. And just look at, at, look at the retail uh, sector that's out there right now. I believe, we believe that that is coming in a lot of other areas. So thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate it. Have a good day.